Okay. So, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Oscar Johnson. I'm Active Director of Stockholm Free World Forum. Um, I'm very delighted to invite you all today for our little uh, roundtable discussion with Frank Rose. Um, Frank is a senior fellow at uh, Brookings, and he has early worked as Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control and Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Space and Defense. Two incredibly relevant topic in today's world, um, somewhat under-discussed, I might add. Um, I think there are issues that we kind of need to rediscover um, to understand again. Um, probably most importantly of all, Frank has done his MA at King's College London, where I did my MA and PhD as well, uh, so happy to, to have you for that. Um, then we also have Mr. John Rudquist, who as uh, Deputy Research Director at Swedish Defense Research Agency, and uh, just simply one of Sweden's foremost experts when it comes to nuclear weapons. And another King's College alumni. <laughs> and another King's College <laughs> alumni. Uh, we have a good reach in our alumni. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to flag for two events we got coming up next week. First, we have a panel discussion on EU's role in the world on Wednesday. And then on Friday, we have a panel discussion on how is defense policy in Sweden doing uh, before the Defense Commission releases the report in early May. I expect that to be a lot of fun. Um, in 2008, we described in the Defense Commission, we said, arms control is a cornerstone for European security. After that, the state of arms control went straight downhill. So we cut that out. We stopped saying that. Um, that does not undermine... That does not belittle how important arms control are, even though it is going, uh, going south in most, uh, most areas, most notably or most publicly with, with the uh, withdrawal of the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Mis Forces Treaty, Forces Treaty yeah. INF. Um, also, um, Frank has a very, very wide portfolio. He's going to give us uh, introductory remarks about 20 minutes, then John's going to comment in 10 minutes, and then we're going to open up for the discussion here with the audience. Um, I just might add, must add to that, I saw India in yesterday, a uh, test launch successfully shooting down a ground to space missile, shooting down air satellite. I don't know if you will comment on that, but that would be... I'm happy to talk about that. I ran yeah. the U.S.-India space security dialogue for okay. some time, so well, I've got that, some good stories there. There were extra We'll do that there. on Chatham House Rules, though. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> we'll do that after we cut, we cut the recording. But uh, very welcome to have you, Frank, and the floor is yours. Great. Well, thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to be back in Stockholm. I think this is the first time I've been in Stockholm when it hasn't been January, so it <laughs> truly is a pleasure. Um, I've got about 20 minutes of remarks, and, and the title of my talk is End of an Era, the INF Treaty, New Start in the Future of, the Str of Strategic Stability. And, and in my presentation, I'd like to do a couple of things. First, place the current state of nuclear arms control and strategic stability in a broader geopolitical context. Second, discuss the reasons for and implications of the end of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces, or INF, treaty. <coughs> Third, discuss the prospects for extending the New START Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. Uh, and finally, make some recommendations as to what a new framework for strategic stability might look like. The thrust of my argument is as follows. The demise of the INF Treaty and overall U.S.-Russia strategic stability regime is the result of fundamental shifts in the geopolitical environment and the evolution of technology. In order to be effective, any new arms control or strategic stability framework will need to incorporate new actors like China and new and emerging technologies like outer space, as you mentioned, and cyber. Um, so let me start by saying we need to acknowledge that the current geopolitical environment that we find ourselves in is very different from the one that we encountered in the 1990s and 2000s. During that period, uh, the key objective of U.S. foreign policy, and I would say EU foreign policy, was integrating Russia and China into the liberal international order. 
However, as my colleague Thomas Wright of the Brookings Institution notes in his recent book, All Measures Short of War, The Contest for the 21st Century in the Future of American Power, quote, the United States is in competition with Russia and China for the future of the international order. Uh, Therefore, the U.S. relationship with those two countries is no longer about integration or convergence, but finding ways to effectively manage competition in a way that reduces the risk of conflict, especially with regards to nuclear weapons. With regards to arms control, I've increasingly come to the view that the progress we made on nuclear arms control and nuclear arms reductions, especially in the late 80s and early 90s, was a result of the unique political circumstances at the time, primarily the collapse of the Soviet Union and Russia's subsequent financial difficulties. Uh, That said, I think the vast majority in the U.S. strategic community, Democrats and Republicans, believe that Russia shared the U.S. view that we needed to continue to reduce the role and numbers of nuclear weapons in our defense strategy. Looking back, I don't believe this was the case. Uh, For example, I always like to say Russia did not sign the New START Treaty because it believed in the world free of nuclear weapons. It does not. Uh, For Russia, New START was primarily about maintaining strategic parity with the United States, capping the number of operationally deployed U.S. strategic nuclear weapons in delivery systems, and providing insights into U.S. The strategic forces that Russia wouldn't necessarily get without the treaty. As one of my Russian colleagues once told me, quote, I fear a world without nuclear weapons. This is a true quote. I, I think he was only being half facetious there. And I think to understand Russia's views on nuclear weapons, you need to look at their overarching strategic situation. I don't think it is a good one. Uh, Russia has no real allies. I mean, they have Lukashenko in Belarus, but that's not all that great right now. And they have Assad in Syria. Other than that, they don't really have any long-term allies. The United States, Sweden, we've got lots of allies and partners. Um, Russia does not have a modern 21st century economy. Think to yourself, besides oil and gas, what does Russia export on the civilian market. I can't think of many things. Uh, Third, while their conventional capabilities have certainly improved since the war in Georgia, they're not on par with the United States at a global level. Um, Fourth, uh, Russia no longer has the strategic weight of numbers with regards to its population. Throughout its history, we talked about the Russian hordes and the Russian steamroller. That's not the case today. They're losing several hundred thousand people a year population-wise. And and then finally, (laughs) they face a large and growing China on their southeastern flank. Now, I understand Russia and China have a strategic partnership, uh, but let's be honest about what that partnership is about. It's about balancing American power. And if you dig beneath that strategic partnership, there are some tension, especially with regards to Chinese influence spreading into Central Asia uh, and and so on. Uh, So looking at this overarching strategic situation, what does Russia have long term to guarantee its security? I would argue nuclear weapons. Um, Let me now turn to the INF or Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Uh, For many of you, are aware Russia has long had concerns about the INF Treaty. Uh, Indeed, the Soviet military had serious concerns about the treaty in the late 80s, but those concerns were overruled by uh, General Secretary Gorbachev because he believed he needed to reduce tensions with the West in order to take defense resources to reinvest that in its civilian economy. Uh, Furthermore, uh, what you may not be aware of, and I was at the Pentagon at this time, in 2004-2005, the Russians proposed 
that the United States and Russia jointly withdraw from the treaty. Uh, this proposal was made by Sergei Ivanov, who was the defense minister at the time. Uh, and they argued that the INF treaty no longer reflected the geostrategic situation in Eurasia. In particular, the Russians noted that the proliferation of medium and intermediate range missiles by states like China, North Korea, India, Pakistan, and Iran made the INF Treaty increasingly irrelevant. Now, the Bush administration declined uh, the Russian offer to move forward with a joint withdrawal. But it's probably about that general time frame that Russia decided to develop this new ground launch cruise missile. Now, in July of 2014, the U.S. Department of State, uh, under the Obama administration, declared Russia in noncompliance of its obligations not to possess, produce, or flight test a ground launch cruise missile with a range capability of 500 kilometers to 5,500 kilometers or to p possess or produce such missiles. Now, I want to make it clear, prior to that public declaration in the summer of 2014, uh, there was a year of quiet diplomacy with the Russians. And the objective of that quiet diplomacy was to say, listen, we know you're in violation of the INF Treaty. Let's find a way to bring you back into compliance. But... Quite honestly, what we got in response were counterclaims that we were in noncompliance. Uh, that said, we continued to engage the Russians for the rest of the Obama administration and into the Trump administration on trying to find a diplomatic solution. All told, we spent almost six years trying to resolve this diplomatically, and we made no progress. Um, therefore... I think the Trump administration's decision to exit the treaty is certainly understandable. Uh, however, from my perspective, the key question was not whether we could have saved the INF treaty. Uh, I think that was a highly doubtful proposition. But whether the Trump administration handled the diplomacy surrounded, surrounding the exit from the treaty effectively. Um, what I had told people in the administration is if you thought it was necessary for the United States to get out of the INF Treaty, you needed to do two things. One, you needed to make sure that public blame for the demise of the treaty was squarely put on the shoulders of Russia. And secondly, and more importantly, you needed to keep the U.S. allies together because fundamentally what INF was really about was alliance unity. Even if you go back into the late 70s, it was about coupling American security with its NATO allies. Unfortunately, the administration's initial announcement of this decision failed on both counts. Uh, President Trump's announcement on the sidelines of a campaign rally without any prior consultations with U.S. allies, in my view, represented clear diplomatic malpractice. Uh, by making the initial announcement in the way they did, <clears throat> the Trump administration made the issue about the United States instead of Russia's violation where blame for the demise of the INF Treaty clearly belongs. That said, uh, since that initial announcement in no the November time frame, the, I'll give the administration credit. They have consulted very closely with the NATO allies. And uh, in a February 1st statement, NATO foreign ministers, uh, or uh, I think NATO as a whole, noted their full support for the U.S. decision to withdraw from the treaty. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we need to acknowledge the INF Treaty's demise is a direct result of the declining fortunes of the U.S. 
Russia's strategic stability regime and the inability of that regime to respond effectively to the evolving security environment. For example, I think Russia and other critics of the treaty have a valid point when they argue that while the INF Treaty constrains uh, Russian and U.S. missile capabilities, it does nothing to limit China. Um, in my view, any future arms control agreement is going to have to find a way to manage the challenge of China, which I would argue in the United States is the country we view as the largest long-term strategic threat. Um, however, it's going to take time to uh, transition to this new strategic framework, and that's one of the reasons why I've been such a proponent of extending the new START treaty by five years as allowed under the terms of the treaty. Um, I think there are a number of good reasons to extend New START. Um, first, it will help maintain stable strategic deterrence between the United States and Russia in the near to midterm. As General John Hyten, uh, commander of U.S. Strategic Command, the military command responsible for U.S. nuclear forces, stated during congressional testimony in March 2017, and I quote, I've stated for the record in the past, and I'll state again, that I'm a big supporter of the treaty. When it comes to nuclear weapons and nuclear capabilities, that bilateral, verifiable arms control agreements are essential to our ability to provide an effective deterrent. Second, the transparency mechanisms, notifications, and dialogue required by the treaty will help prevent miscalculation. Uh, third, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, it will provide valuable time to help facilitate the transition to a new framework for strategic stability. Fourth, it will help maintain domestic political support within the United States to modernize its strategic nuclear forces. Indeed, ratification of the New START Treaty played an important role in bringing congressional Democrats on board in favor of the Strategic Nuclear Modernization Program. Um, it's unclear at this point whether the Trump administration will move forward with New START extension. According to uh, John Bolton, the National Security Advisor, and others, this is an issue under review. Where we will end up is, I don't know. Uh, let me uh, briefly also address the issue of new and emerging technologies. As I previously noted, Emerging technologies like cyber and outer space are increasingly impacting strategic stability calculations, especially with regards to nuclear command, control, and communications. U.S. Director of National Intelligence Dan Coats has highlighted the growing cyber and anti-satellite threat to U.S. and allied critical infrastructure. In testimony before the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence last month, Coates noted, quote, our adversaries and strategic competitors will increasingly use cyber capabilities, including cyber espionage, attack, and influence to seek political, economic, and military advantage over the United States and its allies and partners. And with regards to anti-satellite weapons, he noted that, quote, Russia and China are training and equipping their military space forces and fielding new ASAT weapons to hold U.S. and allied space services at risk, even as they push international agreements on non-weaponization of outer space, end quote. I'm particularly concerned about how cyber and anti-satellite weapons could be used to attack nuclear command and control and communication, or NC3 systems. Indeed, 
the 2018 U.S. Nuclear Posture Review discusses poten the potential cyber threat to NC3 systems and directs the Department of Defense to enhance its ability to defend against these cyber threats. Additionally, other emerging technologies like artificial intelligence also have the ability to impact strategic stability. To date, these emerging technologies have not really played a major role in strategic stability discussions amongst major powers. This needs to change. So let me conclude with, with the following points. Strategic stability in the emerging security environment no longer follows the two state, United States and Russia, in one weapon, nuclear model of the Cold War. Today's security environment includes multiple states and emerging technologies like cyber, outer space, and artificial intelligence. Given these changes in the security environment, we need to develop a new framework, for the, uh, strategic framework, focused primarily on managing great power competition and reducing the risk of nuclear use. On that note, let me make a couple of specific recommendations on how we might achieve this in the near to midterm. First, the United States and Russia should extend the New START Treaty. Extending the treaty will help maintain strategic stability in the near to midterm and provide valuable time as we make the transition to a new strategic framework that includes new actors like China and emerging technologies. Second, the United States and Russia should also convene bilateral strategic stability talks. The purpose of these talks should not be to negotiate a new arms reduction treaty, but to have an honest and frank discussion of each side's strategic concerns and identify practical measures aimed at reducing risk. Third, it is critical to find a way to integrate China into a future strategic stability framework. China has become the United States's most significant long-term competitor. If we cannot find a way to eventually integrate China into a future stability framework, the prospects of establishing an effective framework are dim. That said, I think there are a number of near-term steps we could take between the U.S. and China to get that process started, such as establishing a bilateral missile notification regime, connecting the U.S. Nuclear Risk Reduction Center with an entity in China, developing bilateral norms on outer space issues, and inviting China to participate in a New START inspection. Fourth, we need to establish multilateral strategic dialogues that bring the key nuclear players to the table to discuss stability issues. The chief purpose of these talks would be to both discuss issues of concern and advance measures designed to reduce risk. Such talks could take various forms, a trilateral U.S.-Russia-China format, a P5 format, and perhaps even a, a P5 plus India and Pakistan format at the appropriate time. And finally, we need to develop norms of responsible behavior for emerging domains such as cyber and outer space, and that needs to include a discussion of the impact of emerging technologies on nuclear stability calculations. So let me stop there. I think I did it in exactly 20 minutes. <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> thank you very much for that, Frank. And uh, before I give the floor to John, I would just uh, <coughs> like to thank as well the Swedish Defense Research Agency and John in particular for, uh, for making this little event happen. Um, your thoughts and reflections, John? Well, yeah, thank you. So <coughs> I, I have one, one major reflection um, which deals with uh, what is, where is Sweden in this landscape which Frank has sort of uh, painted for us. And <clears throat> my basic argument here would be that although Sweden 
currently is in the midst of a contentious political debate about how to view the future strategic landscape coupled to uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear arms control, Sweden has to, and the Swedish system, has to look ahead beyond this contentious politi political debate uh, when it comes to nuclear weapons and also think about uh, what Sweden's role in deterrence, regional deterrence is, and in deterrence, how we should view nuclear weapons from an operational and even military point of view. So I'll lay out some, some short comments on why I, why I think that is an important uh, undertaking. But for the sake of, of uh, the ongoing debate, I'll start off and uh, present you with, I think, a, a helpful quote um, when we go ahead talking about nuclear uh, issues. So the quote goes like this. The debate over nuclear deterrence and war and national security policy is often more confused and confusing than informative and productive. In order to make it as useful and accurate as possible, it is important to separate issues that are relevant to government policy from issues that may be valid from some perspective but are not serious policy options. Misconceptions and illusions do not contribute to the formation of substantive recommendations and programs. And Frank has said it in other ways, but I think this is fundamental um, in our future debate going ahead. We have to look at these issues informatively and productively, not from a perspective uh, that actually has no serious policy uh, options. So, Frank has mentioned the, uh, the uh, uh, fundamental shift in the strategic um, uh, landscape. From a Swedish point of view, I think uh, uh, we have to view this from a, what I call a European schizophrenia. Uh, Southern Europe is thinking about uh, defense about, uh, from uh, uh, the threats uh, emerging from the south. We're thinking a lot about the threats emerging from the east. So this is one of the key issues we will have to handle going forward in Sweden. And I think that's already a debate. It's ongoing, but it also links to nuclear issues. Why is that? Well, because deterrence in our part of the world and actually what Sweden is trying to do is enhance deterrence, national deterrence, but also regional deterrence in cooperation with others. Uh, deterrence is hinges on and has a military uh, part. It hinges on the military balance of power in our region, coupled to the different actors uh, we are might be engaged with. And part of that military balance of power is nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons exist. They remain key to alliance, the NATO alliance. They remain absolutely key to Russian defense policy and operational planning. And thus, they are part of uh, the deterrence um, calculus. So Sweden cannot refrain from also looking and debating the role of nuclear weapons from a policy point of view. Now, this is being done, uh, and uh, the debate on the nuclear weapons ban treaty is a debate about disarmament, but it is also a debate about fundamental uh, Swedish strategic capabilities going ahead and looking into the future. Um, Deterrence and military capability has always, in the European and North European perspective, had a war fighting component and a nuclear war fighting component. So that is also key to remember uh, when we look ahead and when we think about deterrence. And so the question is 
can Sweden, in the midst of this political debate about uh, disarmament and ban treaties, also have a discussion about what it means, uh, what the nuclear dimension means for overall deterrence. And Sweden also has to have a debate about what the role of Sweden is and if Sweden is just um, uh, a, uh, an onlooker, watcher, uh, uh, a passive actor in this sort of dynamic or if we can actually do things that enhance deterrence and if we can relate to nuclear deterrence as well. Do we actually have to relate operationally to nuclear deterrence in our region? I think the answer is yes. Have we thought about how this is done? The answer is absolutely no. And during the Cold War, for example, this was a limited discussion, if at all, which was not public. I think going ahead, the decent thing to do is to have a public discussion about not only the political side of nuclear deterrence, but the operational uh, side and what it means for Swedish defense uh, politics and military planning going ahead into the future. This is something we've at least started trying to do at FOI. So I'm now involved in a preliminary uh, um, project which is trying to look into nuclear scenarios and have this open and informative discussion uh, about nuclear issues uh, that will help policy and will help operational planning going ahead. Um, and I think I'll, I'll just stop there uh, for time's sake. We can have a discussion about that, and we're happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, John.